Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous. I'm Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo, and today I'm going to talk about two things. It's going to be a relatively short, I hope, video, and it's going to be about development cycle. Today, that's all I want to talk about. And I want to talk about nothing more than my opinion and my take on where the development of Star Citizen is going. I've been making videos for Star Citizen uh, for a very long time regularly with multiple videos a week. And then as CIG pulled further and further and further back from interacting with community content creators on a regular basis, I kind of moved away from it. But it was kind of a it was kind of one of those vicious cycles that happened because I was getting a little bit more active in my career at Apple I was also going back to school full-time I had children that were getting into college and then nursing school and everything just started to uh, everything just started to snowball into a into a atmosphere that was not conducive to me doing videos. Never in that time did my love for the game, my belief system, wane. Never did I turn my back on Star Citizen and never did I lose faith. There are times that I was a bit salty. There were times that I was a bit angry at certain at certain decisions that CIG made, but in the end, I still believe and I still, well, in the end, I'm still a star citizen. So in the beginning, development cycles were kind of long and drawn out, and they were all based on content. Content-based development cycles are pretty hard for the communities to back because it's very hard for you to see where things are going. In fact, CIG made a lot of claims about what was going to be coming out, and then when it finally came out, it was missing some elements, and the bugs bugs just filled the initial releases. Falling through the ground, having multiple crashes, not even getting enough frame rate to run on high-end systems, all of that were part of the initial development cycles. At some point... I did a video with Ben and I remember asking because Ben and uh, Richard Garriott who runs the, uh, Shroud of the Shroud of the Avatar game, Portalarium, he actually has a very unique way of being abnormally 100% to 150% tra transparent with his customer base with their fans of that game. And their development cycle is kind of, I think it's monthly. And every month, they come out with new content. And no matter what, they're coming out with new content at that date. But if they do not have something done, it's going to move to the back end. Like, they're going to just move it into the next time frame. Early on in my career, I was working as a manager over at Bennigan's. I remember there was a time management class we all had to take. And we all had to start our day with to-dos. And then we'd have to take those to-dos and we'd have to number, you know, put them in the order of mo highest priority. And then you'd have to work your day and try to get everything done. And everything on that to-do list was supposed to be done. But there was always this saying, progress, not perfection, meaning as long as you were working towards everything on that list and got most of it done, you were exceeding expectations. But the last thing on that list, if it wasn't done, it always went to the top of the list of the next day. That's kind of like the development cycle approach that Shroud of the Avatar has. When CIG changed their development cycle, they changed it to a date-based development cycle. And then what they would do is they would fill the next patch that they were going to be coming out with, with everything that they wanted to put in it. I, I saw this as a major step forward from what they had done before, but right in the beginning, right from the start, I saw that there was going to be problems. 
And today we see the problems that exist from there. And that's if you're going to make these patches be content-based, date-based patches, you are going to have an issue where you are going to be extending the development cycle for each one of your patches, which would continuously push back the next patch. And that happened because CIG would try to release everything. Then they would try to get everything they didn't get out in that patch in an iter interim patch or iterative patch. And that would really hold up the whole development cycle on the other end. Now, there is a lot to be said for things like object container streaming, ser server meshing, and other pieces being vital to be out before the patch that was coming next or that patch wouldn't come out. That's why they were doing iterative patches. But in the grand scheme of things, no matter what they did, eventually the number of things that were being pushed back that were holding them up were going to put a big monkey wrench into the development cycle. I'm not going to get too deep into all the things they said about what they're doing now, but what they're doing now is something more like Shroud of the Avatar. They're going to have a release schedule, still going to keep it quarterly, and on the day that it's supposed to rele be released, they're going to come out with the things that are done, and whatever's not is going to get pushed back. I know that this is going to make a lot of people disappointed. I know that a lot of people are going to feel like all of a sudden development is getting stalled because you're going to see a bunch of things constantly moving from being on a roadmap to being pushed back to later patches. But this is the best way to do development on a game of this size. That way we always have some kind of content coming out that's going to build upon what we already have and lay the foundation for what's to come. I really support what they've just done. I support this change more than any other change that they've made to date. And I know some of you are going to call me out and say that I'm just one of those CIG forgivers, that I, I just toot their horn all the time. I wish you would be in my Discord. I wish you would hear me talk about the things I talk about. I'm just as upset as everybody else from time to time, and at times I'm more salty and more upset than some of you. But never does it mean that my faith is broken. I've already said that. Never does it mean that my belief is broken. I've never said that. I don't think that Star Citizen's a scam. I know Chris, I know Sandy, and I know a lot of the people at CIG, and I can tell you their heart, their soul, their mind is really into this game and getting it done. This is their baby. And they're trying to make it the best damn space simulator ever. There's a lot of technology that has to be created for something of such grand scale to come out and fulfill the wishes of so many people that have already pledged. They really do have one of the hardest jobs right now, which is creating the universe that not just Chris envisioned, but Chris, all of his staff, and all of those people that believe so dearly they put up the almost $300 million to get this game made. The new development cycle, I believe, is going to push us forward. And I believe that it's going to actually, after the first few patches, give them the opportunity to actually kick into a higher gear to get these things done. I have to say this, when you don't get a major item done in a patch or a major item done on your to-do list and you have to move it back to the next patch, it becomes a priority and it gets done. A lot of times, I'll, I'll tell you this, it's kind of like in that game, it's a game show, actually it's a reality show, and it's the amazing race. When somebody is given a roadblock or what they call it, a U-turn. To have to go back, it means they have to do extra stuff, so they have to do it faster and harder and execute better. I think that's what this type of a development cycle is gonna do to CIG. If they do have things slip, it's gonna 
teach them to work harder, more efficiently, and to get the things done that need to get done so they can move forward. All right, so I've noticed that there's quite a few more people that have been asking me about the game. I still get PMs, and I get a lot of people that come up to me in real life and ask about it when they know that I've been doing Star Citizen videos. And I know that there's many of you that have been watching me for years and are not new that are going to see this as being redundant and already known, and you've already bought many ships that are well beyond these. But for those of you that are new, the ships that are in my hangar right now are pretty much the starter pack ships that I'm going to talk about today briefly and then over the next few weeks I'll be getting into each one a little bit more in depth and each one of these I think is a viable solution for somebody that wants to get into the game but very specifically I'm going to point out two that would probably be ones that are the best to use in the game when you first start. So we're going to go in a clockwise order starting with this. This is the second starter ship that was introduced. This is the Consolidated Outland Mustang. It's been one of my favorite ships until they changed the look and feel of it. The look of it has been sanitized and it doesn't look as alien as it used to but it still flies and feels the way it used to and i have to say it's still one of my favorite starter ships to fly not my favorite one though but one of my favorites and i think that for the person that's just starting out in star citizen this ship offers you the ability to do anything from missions that involve going out and moving cargo doing pickup and delivery missions to even being able to do light fighter work so mercenary and some distress beacons would be perfect for the ship it's not the best at any of those but it is kind of a jack of all trades if you do want one of the ships to start with this one over here I would actually take over the Aurora MR only because I think it's a little bit prettier of a ship. Moving to the back we have one of the most expensive starter package ships and this is called the Anvil Arrow and to me this is probably the best fighter in that under 100 dollar class. Some people are going to think I'm crazy and they're going to talk about the 300i or the 325a. I just love the way that the ship flies. I love the way that the ship looks and I love its weapons loadout, the standard one that you get. But I will say this, you're not going to make a million credits with this real easy because you're just going to be re you're going to be restricted to running things that have to do with intercepting and scanning for the missions early on. But if you're looking for a light fighter or a couple of light fighters to throw in one of your larger ships, kind of like a Polaris, which is one of the largest ships I'm going to have, this is probably a great ship to have to run cap for that or fighter intercept or fleet air defense for those smaller ships. Coming in at I believe $75, I think this is the most economical and one of the better ships that you can get as a starter. I know $75 and $90 for this and $85 for that are going to be a little bit more expensive. But sometimes when you're playing the game you feel like you're not making much progress in the other two starter ships which are $45 each. In this one over here you have a little bit more room to throw cargo, you have a lot more power, a lot more places to put your weapons, and to me you have a ship that just enters into the next category. And again I'm going to say that it's not the best at anything, it's a jack of all trades, but it is a nice looking ship and does afford you the opportunity to do a lot of those pickup de and delivery missions and still be able to do a lot of the combat missions. I believe you can make 
a couple hundred thousand credits in this and then move up to something like the uh, all right, you can't open any of these which is annoying but it will allow you to move up to something along the lines of I, I guess the most important ship I could tell you to buy early on will be the prospector go out and mine make some money and then move up to the larger ships All right, where I'm telling you to buy that, of my starter ships, this is my favorite. And it isn't great at anything. It isn't good at anything. But it's well-rounded. I know that doesn't make sense. I've taken on uh, defense missions. I've taken on intercept missions, protection missions. I've taken on cargo missions. I've taken on pickup and delivery missions. I think I've done it all in this ship and although it's a little bit tougher I find it a little bit more fun this is built kind of like a b-wing it lands horizontally flies in the vertical and it really just has this unique look and unique way of flying that I just love it but the key is you do have a little bit more cargo room than you do on the other two ships. Is it worth $85? I'm gonna tell you nope, take one of the first two ships. But if you're really looking at buying a ship that has a little bit more to it, this is a very versatile ship that's going to allow you to do many of the missions in the game. And although at times I feel the flight model is broken on it, although I feel sometimes I'm outclassed by everything else around me, I still find a way to persevere in this and when I was doing a rough playthrough on my own when I was taking off from doing videos I was actually able to get pretty far in the ship making a few hundred thousand credits and almost getting up to the point where I could have gotten myself the next ship in line the first ship ever introduced and the one that won my heart over the very first day the hangar module went live was the Aurora MR. The Aurora has been through two major updates or reworks, first for PBR and then a rework to make it uh, fit item system 2.0. And in that time, the Aurora has been tweaked and fine-tuned to be one of the most all-around versatile ships in my fleet. It is not gorgeous to me, it is a tank when you're using it inside of something like Arena Commander. It does have the opportunity to put weapons on quite a few places. I believe we have weapons racks here and here and up top. And it also is one of the few of the starter ships that actually has a sleeper cabin. Well, it's not one of the few. There are three, so we have a sleeper cabin here. We don't have one on the Aurora. Uh, not the Aurora, the Mustang. You could get it on the Mustang B, Beta. You don't have one there, you don't have one there, so you have one on the, 80, the $75 Avenger, and you have one on the Aurora. So it does give you an opportunity to log out on your ship in space and then log back in if you need to. I love the new weapons loadout here with the Gatling guns on the front. You could always put two more guns up here and missiles on top and have yourself a pretty viable ship for doing very early runs. I think you can make a lot of money with the Aurora. I don't list it as my favorite one for reasons of beauty but for versatility and the ability to take a punch and the ability to actually dance between the bullets and laser fire that's coming at you, I think this is a great ship. For most of you that are watching this that haven't joined Star Citizen, I would say pick between those two until the Origin Jump Works 100i and above comes out. At that point, I'll have to evaluate those and see where they fit in line with the true $45 starter ships. If you want to spend a little bit more, you definitely have a few 
back here that make a lot of sense. My favorite one being the Reliant. But there's something that drives me over to the Arrow all the time. Something about this beautiful ship that just makes me wonder. Why am I not playing this game more often when I could be flying inside of such a beautiful ship as this? I'm going to go in-depth into each one of these ships over the next couple of weeks, and I'm going to talk about what the pluses and minuses are of each one. And that's going to be mostly for the new folk. And, you know, in the end, there's so much diversity in the number of ships, in the types of ships, in the, what the ships look like and do, that I don't think there's ever going to be a right or wrong answer. There are people that min-max everything, that talk about the turning radius, about the time to accelerate, about the ability to take a punch, about the ability to carry a bunch of weapons and still be able to fire them. But I think Star Citizen is about making your ship be part of your personality. And like there are many cars across the roads like there are many ships on the sea and many planes in the sky there are going to be many starships in the deep dark of space in the star citizen universe it's been a while since i did any regular coverage of star citizen so it's going to take me a little bit to get back into it i really did pull myself out of the everyday news because i just wanted to cleanse my mind of my pre conceived notions of where the game was so I could come back into it with a more open mind. And I'm going to try to deliver that same open-minded coverage that I delivered in the past. You should be able to see my videos coming at you at about one to two a week for Star Citizen starting this week. And then ramping up to the three a week I used to do. A new show, a state of the game, and some gameplay. I'll be doing my typical ship reviews. I'll be doing some deeper looks into the development of the game. And I'll be doing my best, my absolute best, on getting a crowbar and trying to pry back open that connection that CIG used to have with those of us that are content creators. I think that when they were letting us talk to them things were a little bit a little bit more understandable like we were able to hear our questions being answered by the people that actually worked on the game today i feel like there's a lot of sanita sanitizing of the information that comes to us but there is hope in one of the latest communications that they had with us they talked about having to open up more and to do a little bit better in describing why things come off of the development roadmap. And I think that's a turn in the right direction and possibly one that shows that they might be open to letting us talk to people like Brian again, to letting us talk to people like Chris Smith and like, I guess one of my favorite people and the one that makes most of the clothing in the game, Jay Lee. I, I really am excited to be back. I know it doesn't sound it because I'm fighting a cold. Summer colds really suck. But I am very excited to be back and to be covering Star Citizen once again. For those of you that have been waiting to see me return, I hope I win you back. And I hope I deliver the same amazing content that I've delivered to you in the past. If you like this video, please click the thumbs up button below. If you are one of my subscribers, or if you have subscribed because of this episode, please click the thumbs up button and the notification icon. That way you can help the channel grow and be advised of when my videos come out. I say advised because if I said informed, that might not be right because YouTube 
has a change in their algorithm and you might not get notified of every video anymore that you subscribe to. If you want to be notified of my videos as they come out, I am now making sure that each and every video I put out gets a tweet. So if you go into the video description and follow me on Twitter, you will then be rest, you know, you could then rest assured that you'll be notified of every video that I put out. And folks, just like always, y'all be safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon.